Okay, so we start our session today, short session of two hours. Uh, first, you know, some things maybe some of you don't know yet, but I have published already the first set of exercises, and I have given you two weeks to work on that. So the delivery is, is uh, this Monday in two weeks, 4 a.m. in the morning. Why 4 a.m.? Because some people deliver 12, 30, 1 a.m., so they say, oh, please, you know, before the deadline was at 12. So they say, oh, you know, we deliver very close, give us half an hour, so now I'm giving four full hours, okay? I hope everyone by four will be asleep and not working on the exercise, because otherwise what might happen, everybody delivers at 4.20, 4.30, and say, oh, please give us half an hour more. Yeah. So the, the exercise is out, and one more thing is that uh, the assistants we set up that they, they are going to give the, the, the sessions on Fridays, okay? But you have to, they haven't told me yet what, what time, okay? So you have to go there, be a bit proactive and ask them when are they going to give, you know, push them for to give, to give a time, to provide a time. As I told you, you can have it on a individual basis, one by one, but that won't be very practical. I guess there are many questions that are common. So I just recommend very strongly to have one session, a help session, and then if there are some more questions, we still sort them out with uh, its learning and, and some private consultations, okay? Yeah, that's one thing. Then uh, any questions from the previous session, from the last week, from last week? No? Before this class, there was here a, se uh, a lecture from, uh, you know, they came a guest lecture. What was the topic about? Anyone was here the last hour? No? Okay. So I have to find out by myself. So the menu for today, I'm planning, as I, as I was kind of verifying that the exercise had a solution, I realized that maybe some of you are not so, it requires some Excel skills that I think we have to, how many of you have used Excel in the past? How many of you have used BVA? Excel, BBA. Yep, so we don't have so many people. So I'm going to try to, we are going to discuss, so the menu, what we will talk about today is, I'm going to give some more, uh, discuss a bit more the production potential that we talked last class. So I'm going to break, if you remember what we were doing last class, we ended up in the production system, the architecture, and talking a bit more about the layout and uh, Okay, we ended up in talking about the layout, manifold, tests, and manifolds. So we're going to keep that on ice for, for some time because I think it's important to give you now tools to, to address the exercise. So I'm went, we're going to have a kind of an extended discussion on the production potential. And basically focusing on the calculation, how to calculate it, or how to estimate production profile. From the curve QPP that we call production potential versus any, Q, any GP, NP, so we call that QP from any production potential versus cumulative production. And we already did a very quick example and a bit tricky, but we, you know, you got more or less the idea that that tells us what is the relationship between plateau or decline, how to estimate that, those things from that curve. And focusing on Excel, also Excel implementation. In, and um, uh, after we have done that, uh, I'm going to, yeah, some more orientation about the production potential. And last, we are going to continue, if we have time, we are going to continue on the architecture issue, right? So one, one comment that I want to do at this point is that, or one observation is, many things that I'm sketching here, I'm sketching just very simple, a separator, I'm depicting it like that, just uh, something like this, okay? In reality, you know, that's not, that's just a simplification, so I won't 
run out of page. If I have to draw every small element in the system, it will be very time consuming and at the end it's a bit pointless. So I'm representing here separator by just a simple, just a simple system. Why? Because a simple sketch. Why? Because for our production or for the calculation of the field performance, the only thing that this is doing, this is a fixed pressure point and is separating oil, gas and water. So that's for our discussion, that's the function of this drawing. But you have to keep in, into, in mind that in reality that represents, for example, if you're going to talk that at the end of the processing you just have Q oil, Q gas and Q water, you have to put a lot of other equipment in between to be able to fulfill that function. Just to give you some some idea, I have I have here uh, some collection of separator images. Okay, we're going to go back to that. Okay, this is an overview. You see what, and this is also very simplified. But this is an overview of that the separation or the processing station is not only a separator, but it's actually a bunch of all other components. So let's put that picture here. That we, for our, for field performance, they are not so important. They are important in what I told you, in the processing capacity of the, of the separators, of the train. But really for the field performance, they are not so, they are not so important. and the separator, how it looks like in real life. Okay, so here you have a horizontal separator. And this is really, again, very simple. It just has the, the shell, the vessel, that is, doesn't have anything on top of it. But now if you go and visit the actual platform or the actual production system, this is how it looks like inside. Also, I'm depicting it like it's empty. So it has only the water level and oil level, but but you will see it has a lot of other equipment inside and each one of them is a science each one of them designing it knowing how it works what are the fundamentals the science it, it's a science by itself each each component okay this has another type of separator called a slug catcher that's actually in snow white the field that we have discussed briefly i think i had one more picture that's actually a, a visit that we have made to Gulfax in 2013 and that's how the separator looks like you see you saw the nice vessel the nice shell that you you could recognize that's a separator when you go to the field you see actually it has a lot of pipes on top a lot of valves so it's difficult to see what actually is the equipment the equipment is hidden behind all of that and all of that is necessary to be in place for the equipment to operate properly so this is kind of a disclaimer for you. All the time that I put something, okay, I put a connector, I put wellhead, I put, you have, to f you, have to find, you have to think or you have to be aware that the complexity is much more than what I show you here in class. And also the difference what makes a good NTNU student from an average NTNU student is that you, if you feel some curiosity, you go online and then you begin to search and you begin to find, you will find a lot of information online separators real equipment and you see how it looks like and and that's going to prepare you very well for the for the field for the life in the industry so that you go to the field and then you are expecting to see this black and white drawing and then you find something else a lot of very complex and it's it's you know it's a surprise so just keep that in mind So that's for okay. That's the the only part that actually was nice. This in front you cannot take a picture. There was not enough space, so you had to go all the way to the back to actually see the 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 cylindrical shape that could resemble somehow a separator. That's in Gulfax C. Okay, so be be aware of that. So now let's uh, talk up about. Um, a bit more about the production uh, potential. <coughs> the 
this good here. <clears throat> so we are going to do now a, a like a stepwise way so how to how do you calculate in the in the last class we actually we did a kind of a tricky thing okay we we said we know that the production let's go back a bit we know that the we have this equation that is an integral equation and you have but we have the production potential like a collection of points. So we can discretize this expression using the trapezoidal rule. And then we can find if we are operating all the time at the production potential, that means that we have open choke, okay, it's producing at its maximum. We can compute from this expression, we can compute how the rate is going to go with time. How is it going to decline with time? That was a very uh, uh, neat trick. You know, it took some effort, but finally you got it. And then I told you what happens when you want to have operate in plateau mode. So I told you that we have to find exactly when I will be able to maintain the plateau because for all of these points before, for all of these cumulative productions, I will be able at this point, the potential is much greater than what I want to produce. That means that I have to close the choke to get this rate. Then the same thing until there comes a point where no matter what, how much I open the choke or how much I close, I all the time I'm going to get only one point. For fully open choke, I'm going to get only one point. And if I, I will, won't be able to produce more than that. Hmm? So let's do it now a different way, just uh, stepwise. Let's call it stepwise calculation. And the logic for that is why I want to show you kind of a different way if you already maybe have even a better way. Because this stepwise or step or sequential, let's call it step stepwise, let's call it sequential. And sequential, I think it's with Q. Sequential calculations. That means that you do it like if you were doing it on the, and that concept is useful because that's what some more complex, you will see later in the course, some more complex um, tools like coupling reservoir and production simulator, they use this sequential calculation. You have to do it in each step, you have to make an evaluation. Hmm? So that's why I think it's useful if you also, we discuss a bit this method. So what, what that consists, let's see. You have the production potential Let's call it versus um, QP, okay, that we know that it has certain shape. So you make a table with time and how much you are going to produce, what's going to be the actual rate. Okay, and let's put a table with Q, GP, and the production potential, Q, PP. Initially, there is no production zero. Initially, we're at time zero. And let's say that you want to operate in this ex a small example, we're going to say I want to operate with open choke. Okay, I want to operate all the time at maximum at maximum production. So what should I do to know the rate that I will be able to produce at time zero? I just come with zero to this curve, right? And I read that value, and that's the value that I'm going to put here. The potential is just equal to the rate that I will be producing. So here, let, let's put that point like Q, P, P, one. QPP2 and so forth. Okay, so this will be QPP1 and here again QPP1. Now I have to choose a discretization. How, how you know, how you know the refinement, how close I want, if I want to calculate this curve for every month or for every half a year or for every year. So I just choose something that I choose from the, you know, depending on how I want to make my calculations. Remember, every time, if I make it shorter, I will get a bit better accuracy, and you will see a bit now why. So let's choose 0.5 years. In 0.5 years, let's assume that we can say, let's say in 0.5 years, I will be able to produce the same rate 
as I produce in time zero? What do you think? In time 0.1, will I be able to produce QPP1? No. no? Yes. Why not? Because immediately after I begin to produce, the only way that, or the only moment where I will be able to get this rate is exactly when I start the field. That's the only moment, instantaneous moment, where I will get that rate. After that, the pressure in the reservoir goes down. I have beginning to take material out of the reservoir and immediately the rate declines. Yes? But has an approximation because I don't know what's going to be the rate in time 0 0.5. I don't know yet, okay? But I will assume that between time 0 and time 0 0.5 years, I will be able to produce QPP1. An approximation, okay? That's equal to say, if you are computing the rate, that we want to get a profile like that. let's say that that's a real profile but then we are approximating like this okay so what happened okay i find a new rate then this rate i continue then i find another rate i'm trying to approximate a curve actually to a set of steps and that's what one suggestion one of you when i was doing my calculation why not to use just the rectangular integration so we are doing a trying to approximate the curve by just a rectangular. So how do I calculate here the GP? GP is going to be equal to what, ha what I have produced between 0.5 and 0. Okay, and what is that? That's equal to QPP1, the rate, right? Times the difference in time between the current and the previous time, 0 0.5 minus 0. But that is not in the right units, okay? The rate is in standard cubic meter per day, and the year is year. So you have to put a transformation unit to change from years to days, right? And that's where it plays what I told you. How many operational days we have in a year? And I told you it's never 365, but you have a bit less. So we can use, for example, number of days in a year. Three well not number of days okay we're not reinventing the calendar but number of operational days that's how you calculate how much you have produced up to time 0 0.5 it's an approximation okay make a note but it's a let's hope that it's a good approximation so with that gp what should i do then what can i produce in time 0 0.5 if i'm producing with open choke Now I go with that number, okay, now it comes, let's make an expansion here. Now I go with that number and I go to this plot to obtain, I put it, and then I obtain what is the Q, the open flow potential for that cumulative uh, production. Then I get QP, P2. And as I'm producing at an open choke, I will also be producing QPP2, right? Now let's do it, now let's go to the third step. Now I have one year, okay? in one year I do the same thing, but wait, is can I apply just the same formula down here to calculate the cumulative production up to one year? You, you will add the previous. I have to add the previous one right because here I'm calculating with this expression I'm calculating only between two time steps okay so I have all the time to carry to add up the previous one okay so exactly like you said this is this cell plus what I'm producing uh, that time step 1 minus 0 0.5 times 355 I don't know why I don't Again now, at that point, I'm assuming that that's what I have produced, even I know I have produced less, okay, but that's an error. So I come back, I go to my plot, 
let's put that point put it here I go with GP that's one two that will be GP three I read what is the Q P P three and then that's what I'm going to use to produce for the next time step okay. is that clear yeah so now let's go and do a uh, do it in Excel okay you do you bring your computers yeah so now let's do that exactly the same thing in Excel And you can use the Excel file that I gave you last class. Actually, I'm going to download it from here. That's a file that I uploaded. I hope you have worked with that a bit on, you know, at home. So you have the. We're going to work with the field, okay? We're going to assume that's a with the potential <coughs> of the field. So we're going to work with this column in particular. So now let's make that analysis that I told you. I'm saying time, and that's going to be in years, and we start with zero. So then I'm going to say. Uh, how much I will be producing, the rate that I will be producing from the field. We can call it Q field. And we don't know yet what value what value is that. We have to go to, to the flow potential. Now let's put the GP, how much I have produced. And something that we know for sure is that initially I haven't produced anything, so that value is just zero. Now, let's put here that I want to calculate the QPP of the field. No batteries. Now we put um, Q PP of the field, and that's going to be also have the same units. So at zero, I just come here to the curve. It's very easy. I'm saying that the field production potential I have already calculated here. Hmm? Something very important to note is that the field potential is something very useful to know how much we can produce. Okay, but really, when sometimes it's not physically possible to produce that production potential. Why not? Because if you produce, let's say you have a production system, and in theory it can produce that rate. But if you put it on production on that rate, for example, you might have erosion in the pipes. Okay, And then the life of the pipes, the life of the well, everything, you will have, for example, uh, incremented sand production that you don't want, and then you will damage the formation. So not all the time you can produce at the maximum flow potential. Okay, No, don't, don't be mistaken. Only in, you have to design your system that each well is able to take that rate. Okay? In this case, it's an assumption that we are making, but take that into consideration, especially for a plateau. Usually for systems that we are operating in plateau, we are sure that each well will not produce to its maximum. Okay? Each well will produce much less, but we want to know when that rate, the plateau will finish. That's why we are interested in calculating the behavior of this production potential. So here we said we are going to produce the same. And now let's go to, let's pre-populate that, 0 0.5 years. Okay, 1, 1 1.5. Let's put that in a better format. Okay. 
Now let's go how much I have produced so far. I told you it's the difference in time in years. This one minus the previous one times the number of days in a year. We are saying operational days in a year, so 355. We are assuming that for now. And then we are saying that I have produced this rate. And to be general, we say that's what you have produced in the interval. But then I have to add what I have produced before. So it's this number, zero here. Okay. We don't like these big numbers. They are difficult to read, so many decimal points. So we use um, okay. 1.6 to the power of 9. Now comes, uh, now we have to calculate how much can we produce at that point in time for the next interval. Any has anyone has any idea how to do it from this table? Okay, it's just linear interpolation. I, I you remember that from uh, kindergarten, primary school? Yeah. Just end on Q. Q? Uh, no, P P. This one. Yeah. Okay. I have to make an interpolation, okay? Because let's see, uh, if I try to find here 169 e to the power of 9, it will be between these two, okay? But I, but I don't have the exact number. So I know that the potential is going to be someplace between 9.5 million and 9.3 million. But to know the exact value, I have to do an interpolation. So you can do it like that. You can just come here and try to program the interpolation. What is the formula for linear interpolation? Any of you remember? Y is equal to Y1 plus Y2 minus Y1 divided by X2 minus X1 times X2 minus X. Is that correct? Or is X minus X1? Okay, because I'm doing it in one. Is that correct? Yeah. So I have to, yeah. Y of? Yeah, Y is a function of X. But it's a linear interpolation between two points. You have Y and X, and you have two <coughs> points, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, and you want to find a point in the center x3 okay for example yeah you can program that but i will give you the following recommendation we are going to use uh, we are going to use something called a bba in excel it's very powerful and uh, i recommend you instead of writing all of these long expressions here that is difficult to read what are the arguments what is it taking in i'm just rec i will recommend you to use uh, bba functions okay visual basic functions and for that, you have to be sure in your Excel, you have to be sure that uh, some, you have to be sure uh, Trust Center, you go to, yeah, you go to File, you go to Options, you go to Trust Center, Trust Center Settings, and I think it's this uh, Active Macro Settings on the left. You have to be sure that this says Enable Macros, because sometimes because of the security settings, it won't allow the macros to run by default. So you have to allow it to, to run. In my case, I have enabled, but you could use also, I think, the, the this option. Disable all macros except digital design. Okay, just put enable all macros. Now to access that, you have to punch alt F11 at the same time. Okay, and you access this module. Alt F11, right. So in this, uh, you have all the description of all the of all the the, the BBA functions, of all the BBA routines that Excel has. In this case, we don't have much. We have only one sheet called data, and I think we don't have any plots right here. Yeah. So we are going to add something. If we we can do one thing, we can program directly on data. Okay, we can do program directly on this sheet, the only sheet that we have. Okay, it's going to be in the background. It's not going to be visible, but it's going to be in the background. But also we can do it if we create a new another sheet, we want it to be available also for that sheet. If we, for example, come here and and, uh, okay, and create a new sheet, 
we want it to be able that function to use it to be able to use it also in sheet one so for that you have to create kind of a common repository of functions and that and that repository you click by on the folder right click insert module that's how many of you knew that about this uh, excel bba if, if that's something that everybody knows just i will you know skip the explanation no okay so here you can program expressions, functions, mathematical functions that they can help you to calculate things. So let's do a very simple example. Let's say that we want a function that is called add, okay, or we can call it summation. And we want to put two numbers, okay? We give two numbers and we get one number back. So this function, you have to put the name of the expression and then you have to open a parenthesis to say what are the arguments of this function, of this, uh, of this expression? So let's say that we want to add two numbers, x and y. After we click enter, you see that automatically Excel is uh, smart and it recognizes that you're trying to write a function. Okay, so it closes it automatically. That's the syntax. So now we are going to say, the, what is that, that function going to return? Summation, what it should return? So you say summation, you have to use the same name that you were using up here is equal to x plus y that's the expression as simple as that okay then remember to save it sometimes if we don't save it it causes some trouble and now let's test our function in this new sheet that is empty we have two numbers two and three and we want to say sum summation i think was the name we put one, yep. So we can call it either this way, that you can, you put the name and you put parentheses, and you put, then you select the cells, this cell, comma, this cell, close parentheses and enter. Or you can also begin to write summation. You have to put equal, summation, open parentheses, and now I can use this FX uh, icon here at the top. With this icon opens this window and it's kind of pre-displaying what are the arguments that this function needs. Okay. So I'm going to select here number two and number three and then click okay. Here is going to give you a preview of what is going to be the result of this function. It's five. If you want to see what other functions I have available, so you just click on the cell. Being on the cell, you click FX. And here you have a lot of formulas that are pre-programmed that come with Excel that you can use. And I'm sure that you have used some of these in the past, some average, etc. But if you want to use the ones that you have programmed, you go to user defined. And here you have all the all kind of strange functions, but you search for summation and that's the function that we were using. When you select it, you click OK, and it's going to open exactly the same dialog that we had before. So you have three ways. <coughs> One of them, just writing it, equal, name, uh, parentheses, arguments. You have another way that is write the name, parentheses, then go up, click F. Or you have the last option, which is to search for the function in the library. You choose whatever you want, whatever you are most comfortable with. So I have, I think I have done uh, the interpolation for you, or we can do it very quickly. So linear interpolation that depends on x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3. So we remember we have to have the same number, the same uh, name. And here I write the expression that I, that I want to use, that it was y1, plus x1 minus x3 y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 and it was waiting a parenthesis or it was waiting maybe a this is a multiplier mm -hmm. okay give you some time so you can copy it ok 
Okay, then I save it. Everybody copied the expression? No? Then I save it, very important, and I press again. I can either minimize this window and I will be back in my Excel sheet or I can just press again Alt F11 to shift between the two. So that's what I'm going to use. All of this long story was just to introduce a bit BBA functions that we are going to use quite a lot. And mostly in this course, we try that you won't program it, but we have it pre-programmed for you. But you know that it's a database with functions that you, are, you, know, you, that you can use, that they are available. So here we use this linear interpolation. So it's called lin interpol, very trivial name. And I don't know exactly what was the order. I don't remember exactly. If I put x1, x2 first, so I just put this fx. And then I say, okay, which one will be x1? The value is between these two, right? Yeah. And I'm interpolating with GP. I'm giving GP and I'm trying to obtain the flow potential from the expression. So X is GP and Y is uh, uh, field flow potential. So I select X1, Y1 is the field potential for that cumulative production. Then I select the second cumulative production, the second flow potential, and then finally for the exact number that I want, the cumulative production that I currently have, that is this number here. Yeah, and it's giving, let's now do a quality check, very important. Nine, there is something wrong, I think. 9.6, is that correct? Hmm? It should give a number between these two, right? So that doesn't look correct. Okay, I have to check the expression back. But now I can do something very, yeah, now I know that that's taking the arguments that it needs. Now I can go just add F11, and now check this expression, what is happening here. Okay, this is the other way around. This is X3 minus X1. I think I made also the mistake here in this. Okay, now here it's correct, X minus X1. Okay, I save it again once more, and I'm not sure if it will calculate again the new value, but I just click enter, click on the cell, enter at the end, 948. That looks, has more sense now. Okay, it's in between these two numbers, right? Now I have how much I can produce at that step. I will be producing that rate. And then I go again and again to the next steps. Okay, doing linear interpolation to calculate the, the profile. So I have done that for you. Uh, you have to do it at home. Let's see, right here. Okay, I have already done it for you. Uh, we are used also a step of 0 0.5. And I have was calculating for each step the gas production. And that gives me the following uh, plot. Okay, and I'm comparing it. The other one is the one that we have calculated the last class. Right. You see, it's not exactly the same. Why? Because of this approximation that we are saying a stepwise, you are assuming that you're producing the same rate constant over the whole period, while the other one <coughs> is actually using a very a bit more sophisticated uh, uh, integration. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's, uh, I think it's a homework that you have to do to... Okay, what, how can we avoid the interpolation? Or how, if you see here, you have to select, uh, you have to select the x1 and x2 manually, right? You have one function that simplifies life very much, but now I have to go and see exactly where the value is falling in between. So what do you think I could use for, to simplify my work? So it doesn't depend on that. Any ideas? Okay, I could use, instead of having this, uh, this collection of points, I could convert the points, I could fit a trend line to these points, right? And create an equation. And then I can use this equation to calculate the potential. Right, do all of you know how to do that? Yeah? Okay. 
Anyone that doesn't know how to do that? Nobody? Okay. So I, I believe you. Okay? So you have to... It, there is also another option. What happens if I want to go for interpolation? What happens if I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be, let's say, that the fitting is not okay, right? It doesn't pass exactly through all the points. In this case, I think we had a very, uh, very f a fairly uh, straight line, a fair straight line. Where is the potential here? Okay, so we can approximate that very well, I think, to a straight line. But what happens if that doesn't doesn't go so linear? If that is, for example, a polynomial, or if I use some other expression that doesn't fit so well? In that case, we might just want to trust more on the values, okay, on the on the table that we got. This is especially uh, uh, true for more complex systems, okay. This curve came from very simple equations: materi dry gas material balance and dry gas uh, uh, equations for uh, gas wells. But we might have some other complicated issues where it has a change of trend, or at the beginning was linear and then it changed the trend. For example, reservoir with solution gas to ratio, uh, uh, etc. So for those cases, we may, might not want to use uh, a trending line. And we, to discuss that issue, we just give you now a break. I think you have enough uh, to process now in this first hour, and then when we come back, we are going to talk about the, uh, you know, about this issue. Okay, uh, this part is, uh, you know, it's a bit boring for those of you who know already Excel, but uh, I think they are necessary for, you know, to have everyone more or less in the same ground, and that uh, you also have the tools to solve the exercise. Okay, so those of you who are a bit bored, just bear with me, and those of you who are trying to catch up, you also have to, you know, do your best effort. Uh, okay, so this approach, I feel some notes here. They're I forgot to mention the right name for that. This is Excel BBA. It's a module that allows you to program in Excel. Okay, and it's accessible, accessible if you press Alt F11. But also, uh, the name of this type of function is called UDF, User Defined Function. Okay, that's how Microsoft calls it. And uh, I told you that the difference is why do we create the module? Is the module is available for every ship in the Excel file. But if you create it on the one of the sheets, then it will be available only for that sheet. Okay? And maybe we want to do something else. We said the structure. Now there was one is very important drawback with this approach that I have to go for every I have to do it sequentially, okay, for every time. And for every time I have to go with the GP that I calculated, I have to go <coughs> it falls in between which two values. And then I have to do the interpolation. That's how I detect x1 and x2, and I put them here in this. They're going to change all the time. Hmm? For the second? You want to do one more? Yes, maybe two. Okay. Okay, so now we say how much I will be producing this amount for the next year, for from 0 0.5 for the next half a year, sorry. For the next 0 0.5 until one. So I drag now this column, and you see that this is calculating with the rate from the previous times the difference in time plus what you have produced so far. Okay. Hmm? Now I have this new number, and I have to detect, <coughs> I have to calculate the flow potential for that cumulative production. Where is this located? Is it still between these two? Okay, is it still between the two? This number is between zero and seven e to the nine. So I can use just exactly this expression. I copy, paste it here, but I have to change the x three. Okay, the value actually where I want to calculate the production potential. Now it's not one point six nine, <coughs> but it's three point three eight. I just drag it down. As simple as that, enter, 941, okay? And it looks, again, logical, it's between these two numbers, <coughs> right? And that's going to be the value, as we are producing all the time at open choke, that's the value that we will be producing in year one. Okay. And you progress like that 
for all the time, for all the time. I think last time we plotted uh, was something like 20 something years. So you have to do that for 20 years. Now that creates a problem because you have to, physically you have to detect where, and that's where you detect X1 and X2. Okay, and that's, so that requires some user input. So one way to, to overcome that is I created my own function and I uploaded it to its learning. It's under the folder of today. And the function is called UDF table interpolation. It's a text file, okay? But it contains, you can copy and paste it in your Excel file that you're working on now. Okay, and the thing that it's doing is you provide a matrix, a matrix of value, a collection of values. And then you say, this is the number that I want. Okay, so let's copy maybe that. I'm not going to go into details of this function. Those of you who want ha have some inclination for programming, like it very much, can go and review it and even improve it. It's very, a very um, uh, badly programmed function, but it's doing its work. Okay, so I propose to use this function where the matrix is just, it can be a table, any table. You have X, <coughs> the first column is all the time the X's, X1, X2, Xn, and then you have certain different variables, okay? Variable one, variable two. Initially, I built this function for a black oil interpolator. Maybe we will talk about that later in the course. So the matrix can be like that. So you want the value, for example, let's say you have a value x3 that you want to have, you want to find the value. Okay, so that's, that value x3 goes in this part in the function. The matrix is, you have to select the whole range of the matrix. That goes here. And then column is which variable you want. You might have different things. In this black oil calculator, we had BO, we had BG, we had viscosity of oil, etc. Okay. Now in our case we have only one, so the column is, this is column one, we don't want one, it will be just a stupid thing to do, so we select two, that's where we have the, the production potential. Okay. That's how this, uh, this uh, formula works, this uh, equation works. So in order to put it in our Excel sheet, we open the text file that I gave you, and we select all, copy, then we go again to the module that we had, Alt F11, and we paste it. There is no need to make uh, to put them in a separate module. You can put many functions in the same module. So Control V, we paste it, and we check that everything looks okay. There are some comments. Hmm? So now let's try to use this function with uh, the 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 problem that we have. Now I can see here very quickly. Here I have GP, and here I have the field. So I have actually four columns, okay? The first one is GP, second one PR, the third one is the well, and the fourth is the field. So the column has to be four, <coughs> number four, okay? So, so let's do that. Let's, instead of using this, we put here the value for reference to know that it gives the same result. So we say equal to table inter interpol, tab interpol and then we say which value which x3 we want to find this number here then which column is in the fourth column one two three four and then we have to give the matrix and the matrix we select the whole the whole data set okay. now when we drag it down we don't want it to be changing because when we drag that info, that equation down, it's going to try to take <coughs> this number, eight, it's going to go down eight, uh, nine, 10, 11, 12. And we don't want it to do that. We want that table to remain all the time constant. So for that, we're going to use, hmm? we're going to block it, F4. Block in A, you have twice the dollar sign next to the, the letter. And that means that it's going to be fixed. No matter if I drag it down, that's going to stay all the time in that matrix. Close parenthesis, enter, 
okay, gives exactly the same result. Now I have saved, I don't have to go manually and, visu and visually to check that. I can just use this equation that will do it for me. And the way it works, that equation first is saving the matrix, then it's going to go on this column with the number that I provided, and it's going to say <coughs> ask. Is the number between this and this? No, okay, then it's going to go. Is the number between this and this? No, then goes. If it finds a match, okay, it's actually between these two, execute interpolation between those two rows. And that's more or less what he's saying here. This reduces the Searching through the column. If the number is between this and this, no, then I jump, continue. Is the number between these two? Jump, continue. Until I find the match. When I find the match, it's exactly the same equation, linear interpolation equation that I was us using before. Okay? Okay, so I can now drag, uh, maybe I could drag, I could try to drag all of them at the same time. Hmm? That, will that make sense? Let's try to see if it works or if it, or if it crashes. Okay, something happened. What happened? Okay, it's working, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I... Oh, yeah, it's taking that value, okay. So this one should be not J, but it should be actually this number. Then you can drag it down. And if I continue, 6.5, 7, <coughs> all the way until the 20 years that we had before. Let's plot that. Um, so insert the plot. <coughs> okay, where time is then in the x axis and the rate is in the y axis, the rate of the field. I'm all the time producing a open choke. Is that correct? It's kind of linear. Looks suspicious. Okay, the other one gave us something like that. So what are we doing wrong? Okay, so let's go back and see because it looks kind of linear. And the previous, the one that we got, the previous class was. Um, Wait, uh, did, did you lose the second argument? Let's see. Uh, where? You lose the behavior of interpolation formula. In the interpolation. Are you getting any of you are, are getting a curve? Linear. Linear for all of you? Uh, 
You have to do some debugging in class. That's not fun. Maybe I was plotting. I'm, I, I'm plotting. I have to plot G. So F G is like that already. I cannot see anything wrong. I don't know what's. Uh Well, you have homework then, one more homework, <laughs> to find out why what the professor did wrong in class. QF versus time. Anyone found it? And is too shy, is too shy to reveal it? No? Okay. Well, we, we, maybe I find it later and I told you, I think it's better to continue, or we do one more Let's try one more minute. Check that already, right? It looked okay. Let's check another value. Let's say one. I think it goes to three six five to the ten. Three six five and it should give seven nine seven, seven million. Yep, seven million. That looks okay. F and G. It's not linear anymore. Hmm? It's not linear anymore. It's not linear? Well, but what we got last time, I think it's the same data. We got last time was... Uh, was Where was it? Something like that? What? The field? And that doesn't look like that, I think. Yeah, it doesn't. Actually, it's even the values are not even Oh, but why the values? Oh, because we, we are oh, okay. The number of wells. I think we in that case we were using eight. got a person that is uh, paying attention to detail okay so we of course we were using for that case we were using the field we were saying there were eight I think eight wells 
And why, what's happening here? Oh, here it's already going out of the range. The table is 2.11 is the maximum. So of course, if you go more than that, you won't able be able to interpret it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now it's giving what we expected, what we hoped. Let's put that in the plot. So now let's go and do two more things before, before leaving this issue, leaving Excel. So, uh, so far, any question on that? <coughs> no? Okay, production versus year. Okay, we obtained that, but remember, uh, here we are assuming that the rate, even though it's it plotting it like that, the rate is remaining constant up to this point, then this rate remains constant, then this rate remains constant, and so forth. Okay, so it's almost like a kind of a bar type chart. You can plot it like that. That's what we are assuming to do the calculations. Now, as any, uh, as with the numerical method, if you make the discretization very small, you make it one month or you make it you know two months then it will be better than if you do it every six months or if you do it every year okay very important now what happens if we are operating in plateau mode okay let's say that from the field someone has determined using the same maybe we can save it with a different name okay we save it and then we save with a different name where is it I'm going to save it like uh, plateau. Now what happens if I'm producing in plateau mode? Now the plateau, the, the field production is, is given by me. Okay, I'm the one deciding. And I can use this rule of thumb, I can use any other kind of approximation. I think last time we said that we were going to use 20, right? 20 million by the rule of thumb and also we had a contract. Okay, so let's say that we are going to use 20 million so here, that number is not coming all the t not coming from the potential. That's coming from my head. Okay, I'm going to put 20 e to the six. Now, what do I have to make sure that that number is below the potential? Okay, for that time, right? Because if it's below the potential, it means that I can produce it. So I put 20 for the first half a year, and my production potential could produce 76. Let me put all of that in, that's not good. Let me put that in uh, scientific. Okay. In reality, I go, I haven't produced anything. I go with initial reservoir pressure and I go to my table. And I say, you could produce, if you want, at open chop, you could produce 76 million. So, so I want to produce 20, that's feasible. That's a feasible number. So I will produce 24 the next half a year. Okay. Then I come back and say, is this number greater? I calculate the potential for that cumulative production. Is it 75 million? I want to produce 20. It's less than that, so I will be able to produce it. It's a feasible rate. Okay, and I continue like that until what? There comes a point where this 20 is going to be exactly equal to the potential. That point is going to be the end of the plateau. Okay, because no matter what I do, I have fully open choke. I cannot do anything else. So in that part, I will enter into decline. So how do I detect that? So far I have 20 in every year, okay? And I will see 20, where do I have? Still not reached, so let's put some more years. I think the, it was something like 20 something, 26, okay. 25 years, so here you see 20, that's a potential, and then it goes to, goes to a value lower than 20. So the end of the plateau is going to be between 25 and 25 and a half years. Okay, is that clear? Now that's maybe not, not very good because in this case we're, use, we're using a discretization of half a year. Okay, but what happens if we have a discretization of a year and we know it's going to be between 2020 and 2000 and 
21. But we want to know exactly when the plateau is going to finish. That's very important, for example, for economical calculations. So how do I do that? How do I find exactly when the plateau will finish? Interpolation. Hmm? Interpolation. I have to do some interpolation, but... Uh, So it's between these two, right? 25 and 25.5, okay? From here I know that the values, I can no longer produce that. So what I can do, I can, I can reduce, right? I can put, for example, 25.3. I still have 25.3, I got 20 exactly, right? So that will be the end of the plateau. Okay. In this case, I was lucky. Okay, I could have tried twenty-five point two. Now it's greater, still greater. So twenty-five point five, twenty. Now twenty-five point three. Okay. How do I get exactly change this number until here? I get exactly twenty. That will be the end of the plateau. How do I do that? Anyone has any idea? Solver. Hmm? Solver. How many of you are familiar with solver? Only a few? Okay. Okay. Uh, for solver, it's a bit more complicated. You have to go to File and, uh, and Options, Add ins, and um, here you have to go click on this button, Go. And this problem in uh, solver is going to be in English, it's going to be solver, but in, in Norwegian it's problem lesson. Okay? So you have to activate, you have to tick on that. Cool. Now when you click on data, you should have solver here to the right. Okay, and solver, we won't go into details too much, but solver is a uh, numerical, a numerical uh, solver of equations that can tell you, that can drive certain variable to zero or can maximize or can minimize uh, if it's in Excel. If all the equations are in Excel, it can do maximization, minimization, or send to a value, okay? Now, here I have to, but one thing I tried before in class, maybe one of you has a solution. I tried, we, if I'm using this function that I programmed, tab interpol, the solver doesn't work very well. I don't know why. So I am here, I'm going to go back to this linear interpolation that I was using, okay, linear. How was linear interpol? Or was interpol? Lin interpol, okay. I'm going to go back to that function because the solver seems to have a problem with my function that I programmed. I don't know why. I was trying to find out, but I don't know why. I think it has to do something the way the matrix, the way the data set is stored. Okay, so now only for this line, I'm going to go back to this linear interpolation. I'm going to say which one is my x. I think that was the order of the values. No, x1. So my x is 1.8. I go in my table. 1.8 is here between these two. Okay, so this is my x1 and x2. So let's do that. x1 is uh, this value here, y1 this value here, x2, y2, and then x3 is exactly this value. And uh, let me see if I change here, if it's working okay, 25.2. Okay, I get what I got before. So now I can use, I can say that exactly one that the rate, the potential to be equal to 20 million. Okay, these two, this cell, the potential and the rate that I'm imposing, please find, let me just copy that and put it in Excel.
So this value, the production potential, QPP, and this value, QP, should be the same. Change by changing this date here. Okay? So let's see now if it works. I think I tried and it works. So let's go and open this problem solver. And it's asking, let's copy also that figure here. So you get that interface and the interface is saying, this is the cell in the sheet that you want to objective, it's called objective cell that you want to maximize that you want to minimize or that you want to drive to certain value now here we have a problem because we want two cells to be equal okay but we have two cells so we can how we can put that condition here okay one way the same thing to say two things are equal is that the subtraction of the two one minus the other is equal to zero okay that's maybe one way to do it so here you select what do you want to do if you want to maximize minimize or if you want to if when you click here you're going to get the option to put a value and uh, here you put you select the cells that you want to change to drive that one to zero and here we want to uh, cells to change it's called also the variables And here we give some constraints. What are for the constraints? We will see later that constraints can be, for example, you want to increase production, but within the separation capacity. Okay? You don't want to increase, for example, the rate too much because then you will have problems processing that oil. Or for example, if you're producing from a well, you don't want to produce above certain value because then you will have sand production problems. You will damage the formation. But also we can put some things to help to help to see where to guess because that's going to use an algorithm to process and try to minimize by changing these values going to use an algorithm but if you tell it I know the solution is between these two you bound the solution then that helps to the to the engine that this thing has behind to operate much quicker so in our case we know where is the where is what time should it be we know it's something, if I put 22.2, it works okay. It, it's greater, the potential, than the rate. But if I put 25.3, okay, let me put more decimal points. Okay, it's already below. So we know it has to be between 25.2 and 25.3. And that's a good, a good, uh, a very good help for the solver. We can close that window constraints and constraints can be operational constraints that means things that we have to honor or it can also be help bounds variable bounds to help the optimizer, okay, to help the solver. We can put just solver. So now let's try to, to put that problem. And uh, so remember, I want to minimize a cell. So in that cell, I can say that is this number minus this number, okay? And I want to drive it to zero. I think that might work. But if you ask, we have here some people some people coming from the optimization background. No? We have one. And they don't like absolutes. Okay, they don't like that the result can be either positive or negative. Because they say it's more difficult for the optim it, it might be that that the optimizer doesn't work properly if you just put just a, a sus subtraction. Okay? So they prefer to use all the time a positive value. Okay, and how do we make it positive? 
we put either absolute in Excel or we put a squared. Okay, we minimize, then we will try to minimize the square subtraction between these two values. Okay. So let's see now, we go to our solver. Solver, 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 please minimize this cell by changing the cell with time. And now I want to give you some more help. I'm saying that this cell has to be less than 25.3. I just test it manually. And also that cell has to be greater than 25.2. And it found exactly when it happens. Yeah, you, you cannot see much difference. 25.3 was very close, but 25.29. That's exactly when the plateau is going to finish. What do, what do I have to do from that point on? From that point, it cannot produce any more 20. So what will be, how the field will be operating? Up to that point, I had to open the choke, open the choke, open the choke every year until I reach 25. When I reach 25.29, choke is fully open, so it's going to enter into flowing the potential. And what do I have to do? What we just did before, okay? You have to, again, for this year, you have to calculate the potential, okay? This is calculated, assuming that this rate is constant, okay, between these two. And this is going to be equal to that number. What happened here? Okay, you need to calculate the you don't have that data with you. Hmm? You don't have that data uh, from the 26 to 30. You don't have that defined. Uh, yeah, but why is it going up? Hmm? Yeah, but we have the plateau of 20, and then it should decline. Okay, so why is it going up? Okay, because it's the scale, okay? The scale can trick you sometimes. So let's put it that we want the scale all the time to go from zero. Okay, and 68, that's the last value, so we can select just the plot and put here 68 and 68 here. Okay, um, so that's one way, and that way you will see that that's actually, when, when we move forward, we will see that there is not so often that you have these curves available from the production department and from the reservoir department, okay? You have to work actually with models. So each model is going to output, depending on what you, like in this case, what we were doing was calculating the rate from the potential, then we assume that we are producing that rate for a certain time, and then we go back with that cumulative production, go back, obtain a new potential, and rerun the model again for the next time step, okay? This, the logic for uh, this in reality is done with a reservoir model and a production model, okay? That all the time, the reservoir model gives, you put a rate, a potential in the reservoir model, run the reservoir model, see how much the pressure has gone down, then you go back to the production model, and then you calculate what is the potential, then you return to the reservoir model and so forth. Okay, so that in a way, this way of solving the exercise is very similar to what's done in real life in the company. Okay, but not using the pre-computed values, but just calculating live the values. So that's why I decided just to show you this way. It's a bit long. It took longer time than expected, but it's also to prepare you for for the for the future. Now you might say we might enter into one something else. Well, I just want to write that, I think the comment, I made it, but uh, 
So it, it might not be possible. to produce at the production potential especially for early times okay that means that your production system is made for a rate much less okay because of we can put here those issues we have damage to the formation that means uh, sand production we can also create if we put some uh, drawdown too high in the well we can get what water coning or gas coning okay. or you can also have erosion problems in the lines Or you might also have critical flow in some part of the system, critical flow. Okay. And that doesn't allow it to flow uh, anymore. Okay, This doesn't allow to have a greater flow. There is a kind of a limitation in the maximum rate. So your system has to be sized for that limitation in the maximum rate. Yeah, I think I, the the other part I will continue tomorrow, but um, yeah, we can just break the session for now because uh, all the topics that I have require like uh, you know a longer discussion. And please, you know, work on the things that we have covered now in this lecture. Please try to work and bring them fresh for tomorrow because we, I will make a final comment before we close this production potential. And, uh, and then we will begin to talk about the architecture of production systems. Okay? Thank you.